Disclaimer. This material is for entertainment purposes only, and for no other purpose. Please consult a legal professional for proper legal advice, including understanding what this document means. Please consult the actual legal document for all legal uses. This presentation is no substitute for the actual file document. We cannot help you if you do not follow this simple, reasonable, and good advice. Please let us know about any errors in this presentation so that we can correct them. Unfortunately, we cannot and will not correct any errors made in the underlying documents, so please make sure the error is a presentation error. Thank you very much for your time, support, and interest. We hope you enjoy this content. Sponsors Unfortunately, there are no video sponsors or channel sponsors at this time. If you would like to sponsor us, please reach out. All donations are welcome. Thank you. Please remember to like this video, subscribe to our channel for more videos like this, and share this video with others. Doing this will help us reach other interested people, and will help to support this channel. We appreciate your action. Thank you. Chapter 5 A Coup in Search of Illegal Theory On the morning of January 6, 2021, Vice President Michael R. Pence gathered his staff to pray. Vice President Pence and his closest advisors knew the day ahead would be a challenging one. They asked God for guidance and wisdom in the hours to come. No Republican had been more loyal to President Donald J. Trump throughout his turbulent presidency than Vice President Pence. The Vice President rarely, if ever, criticized his boss. But as January 6 approached, President Trump turned on his own Vice President. President Trump was desperate. As described in the previous chapters, the president was searching for a way to stay in power. He had lost the election to former Vice President Biden. He had run out of legal options to overturn the election weeks earlier, when his lawyers lost nearly every court challenge they filed. The president pursued other means as well. President Trump and his lawyers tried to convince state and local officials to overturn the election, but they met resistance. Those same officials would not break the law or violate their oath to the Constitution. President Trump and his associates tried to convince state legislatures to replace the legitimate electors won by former Vice President Biden with Trump electors. The Trump campaign even convened their own fake electors who submitted false electoral votes to Washington. But those efforts failed, too. President Trump also attempted to use the Department of Justice, DOJ, for his own corrupt political purposes. President Trump offered the job of acting attorney general to a loyalist. He wanted this same DOJ official, Jeffrey Clark, to send a letter to several states suggesting that they should certify the fake electors convened by the Trump campaign. President Trump's effort to subvert the DOJ came to a head on January 3, when the department's senior personnel and lawyers in the White House Counsel's Office threatened mass resignations if Clark was installed. At that point, Theories about a role the vice president could play at the joint session had been circulating in certain corners of the Internet and among Trump supporting attorneys. President Trump focused his attention on the man who had loyally served by his side for four years. On January 4, 2021, President Trump summoned Vice President Pence to a meeting in the Oval Office with John Eastman, a law professor representing President Trump in litigation challenging the election result. Eastman argued, on President Trump's behalf, that the vice president could take matters into his own hands during the joint session on January 6. Eastman offered Vice President Pence two options. First, the vice president could unilaterally reject the certified electors from several states won by former Vice President Biden, thereby handing the presidency to President Trump. Or, according to Eastman, Vice President Pence could delay the joint session to give state legislatures the opportunity to certify new electors loyal to the president. Eastman admitted, in front of the president, that both options violated the Electoral Count Act of 1887, the statute that sets forth the process for counting and disputing electoral votes during the joint session. Eastman admitted as much in this subsequent conversation with the vice president's staff as well. Therefore, President Trump knew, or should have known, that this scheme was illegal, in fact, it violated the Electoral Count Act and the U.S. Constitution. President Trump repeatedly demanded that Vice President Pence go through with it anyway. Vice President Pence rejected President Trump's demands many times on January 4 and in the days that followed. Vice President Pence correctly pointed out that he had no power to take any action other than counting the certified electoral votes. 
America's founders could not possibly have contemplated a scenario in which the vice president could unilaterally reject electoral votes and decide the outcome of a presidential election. However, instead of backing down, President Trump ratcheted up the pressure even further, relentlessly harassing Vice President Pence both in public and in private. President Trump used his bully pulpit, at rallies and on Twitter, to lie to his supporters. President Trump told them that Vice President Pence had the power to deliver another four years in the White House. It was not true. President Trump's campaign of coercion became so intense that Mark Short, Vice President Pence's chief of staff, alerted the head of the Vice President's Secret Service detail to the impending danger. On January 5, Short warned that as the disagreements between President Trump and Vice President Pence became more public, that the president would lash out in some way. Indeed, President Trump did. And those around him recognized that his lashing out at the vice president could have disastrous consequences. On the morning of January 6, an agent in the Secret Service's intelligence division was alerted to online chatter regarding the VP being a dead man walking if he doesn't do the right thing. A few minutes later, another agent made a comment that turned out to be an ominous prediction, I saw several other alerts saying they will storm the, Seattle if he, the vice president, doesn't do the right thing etc. During his speech at the Ellipse on January 6, President Trump repeatedly pointed his finger at Vice President Pence. President Trump insisted that if Mike Pence does the right thing, we win the election. President Trump added, and Mike Pence is going to have to come through for us, and if he doesn't, that will be a, a sad day for our country because you're sworn to uphold our constitution. President Trump's scheme required Vice President Pence to break his oath to the Constitution, not uphold it. By the time President Trump spoke at the Ellipse, he also knew that Vice President Pence had no intention of overturning the election. President Trump then sent a mob to the U.S. Capitol. He did so even after being informed by the Secret Service that people in the crowd possessed weapons. He wanted his supporters to intimidate Vice President Pence and any other Republican who refused his demands. The president told the crowd assembled before him to march down Pennsylvania Avenue, to our Republicans, the weak ones at the U.S. Capitol, to try and give them the kind of pride and boldness that they need to take back our country. The mob overran the U.S. Capitol in short order. At 2.24 p.m., while the attack was well underway, President Trump tweeted. Mike Pence didn't have the courage to do what should have been done to protect our country and our Constitution giving states a chance to certify a corrected set of facts, not the fraudulent or inaccurate ones which they were asked to previously certify. USA demands the truth. Again, the opposite was true. Vice President Pence showed courage on January 6. The vice president refused to be intimidated by President Trump's mob, even as chants of hang Mike Pence. Echoed throughout the halls of the U.S. Capitol and a makeshift gallows was constructed on the Capitol grounds. It is no mystery why the mob turned on Vice President Pence. President Trump told his supporters that the election was stolen, and that Vice President Pence had the power, but lacked the courage, to fix it. None of this was true. President Trump and Vice President Pence have both reflected on the events of January 6 in the months since then. Vice President Pence has described President Trump's demands as un-American. President Trump has since insisted that Vice President Pence could have overturned the election. Asked about the calls to hang the vice president, President Trump said it was common sense. In early 2022, U.S. District Judge David Carter evaluated the Trump Eastman scheme to pressure the vice president. Judge Carter described it as a campaign to overturn a Democratic election, an action unprecedented in American history. It was a coup in search of a legal theory, Judge Carter found, that likely violated at least two federal laws. The Trump Eastman scheme was not a feature of the U.S. Constitution as President Trump told his supporters. Instead, it would have permanently ended the peaceful transition of power, undermining American democracy and the Constitution. And it all began because President Trump refused to accept the result of the election, expressed through the votes of 81 million Americans. 5.1 President Trump and his allies embark on a desperate gambit to block certification of the 2020 presidential election. The intellectual framework for the theory that the vice president could change the outcome of the election at the joint session emerged from discussions among the lawyers working with the Trump campaign after the 2020 election. 
when the Electoral College met to cast votes for the certified winner in each state on December 14, 2020, any possibility of President Trump reversing his defeat came to an end. The contest was decided well before then, but December 14 marked what should have been the formal end of the Trump campaign. Former Vice President Biden had won the election and his victory was cemented by the state's electoral votes. Instead of bowing to this reality, some pro-Trump lawyers had already begun scheming ways to deny the inevitable. Over the course of the post-election period, as their other plans each failed, the importance of January 6 and the need to pressure Vice President Pence increased. These same lawyers concluded that the Vice President could help President Trump subvert the election on January 6, but they would need Vice President Pence to set aside history and the law to do so. They'd need him to violate the Electoral Count Act of 1887, the ESA. The ESA had governed the joint session for 130 years, but it was an inconvenient barrier for President Trump's plan to stay in office. Kenneth Casebro articulated a president of the Senate strategy in early December, when the Trump campaign was convening alternate electors in key states President Trump lost. On December 13, 2020, Kenneth Casebro, a pro-Trump lawyer, sent a memo to Rudolph Giuliani, the president's lead outside counsel, upon request from Trump campaign official Boris Epstein. Casebro laid out a president of the Senate strategy, arguing that the president of the Senate, he, and he alone, is charged with making judgments about what to do if there are conflicting votes. Casebro argued that when the joint session met on January 6, the president of the Senate should not count Arizona's electoral college votes for former Vice President Biden, because there are two slates of votes. Of course, there were not two legitimate slates of votes from Arizona. There were the official electors, certified by the state, and a group of fake electors convened by the Trump campaign. Casebro's memo set President Trump's pressure campaign on a course to target the vice president on January 6. Judge Carter found that the draft memo pushed a strategy that knowingly violated the Electoral Count Act and is both intimately related to and clearly advanced the plan to obstruct the joint session of Congress on January 6, 2021. That plan was also advanced by John Eastman. On December 23, John Eastman drafted the first of his two January 6 scenario memos, articulating the argument that under the Constitution the vice president is the ultimate arbiter. On December 23, 2020, Eastman wrote a two-page memo summarizing ways to ensure that President Trump is re-elected. Eastman suggested that Vice President Pence could refuse to count the Electoral College votes from seven states, Arizona, Georgia, Michigan, Nevada, New Mexico, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. According to Eastman, Vice President Pence could simply reject these states' Electoral College votes. At that point, President Trump would have 232 Electoral College votes compared to former Vice President Biden's 222. This was sufficient, in Eastman's view, to guarantee President Trump's victory, because he would have a majority of the Electoral College votes. Pence then gavels President Trump as re-elected, Eastman wrote. Eastman considered the possibility that Democrats in Congress would object, stating the plain truth that 270 Electoral College votes are necessary to win. In that event, according to Eastman, the election could be sent to the House of Representatives. The Republican majority of delegations in the House would then re-elect Trump as president. Eastman concluded, the main thing here is that Pence should do this without asking for permission, either from a vote of the joint session or from the court. The fact is that the Constitution assigns this power to the vice president as the ultimate arbiter. We should take all of our actions with that in mind. From the start, President Trump was looped in on Eastman's proposal. The same day Eastman started preparing the memo, he sent an email to President Trump's assistant Molly Michael, at 1.32 p.m., is the president available for a very quick call today at some point? Just want to update him on our overall strategic thinking. Only five minutes later, Eastman received a call from the White House switchboard, according to his phone records, the conversation lasted for almost 23 minutes. Eastman changed his evaluation of the Twelfth Amendment, and the role of the vice president, after President Trump lost the election. In Eastman's theory, which was the foundation of President Trump's January 6 plot, the vice president of the United States is the ultimate arbiter and could unilaterally decide the victor of the 2020 presidential election. However, just before the 2020 presidential election, Eastman had acknowledged in writing that the vice president had no such expansive power. 
in the course of a lengthy exchange of ideas and emails throughout the pre- and post-election period with an individual named Bruce Colbert, Eastman provided comments on a letter Colbert was drafting to President Trump. The draft letter purported to provide recommendations of crucial legal actions for the Trump campaign to take to help secure your election victory as President of the United States. One of the draft letter's recommendations was that the President of the Senate decides authoritatively what certificates from the states to open. In response, Eastman wrote on October 17, 2020, I don't agree with this and continued, the 12th Amendment only says that the President of the Senate opens the ballots in the joint session and then, in the passive voice, that the votes shall then be counted. 3 U.S.C. Section 12 says merely that he is the presiding officer, and then it spells out specific procedures, presumptions, and default rules for which slates will be counted. Nowhere does it suggest that the President of the Senate gets to make the determination on his own. Section 15 doesn't, either. By the first week of December, Eastman's correspondence with this same individual illustrates that he was open to advocating for the very point he had rejected before the election, that is, that the Twelfth Amendment confers dispositive authority on the President of the Senate to decide which slate to count. And on December 5, 2020, Eastman wrote to Colbert, I have spoken directly with folks at the top of the chain of command on this. They are now aware of the issues. The emails also signaled another idea that Eastman would continue to repeat in the coming weeks, that the vice president could act without getting permission from a court. Specifically, he argued that they could take the position that the vice president's authority was a non-justiciable political question in other words, that Vice President Pence could just act, and no court would have jurisdiction to rule on the issue. As Eastman's emails later in the month make clear, he thought there was an important reason to keep this issue out of the courts, they would rule that the theory was unlawful. Eastman's January 6 scenario clearly required the vice president to violate the Electoral Count Act, the federal law governing the certification of presidential elections. There are other parts of Eastman's two-page December 23 memo worthy of attention. Eastman wrote that Vice President Pence could recuse himself from presiding over the joint session of Congress on January 6. In that event, the session would be overseen by the Senate President pro tempore, Senator Charles Grassley. Eastman was clearly arguing that Vice President Pence, or Senator Grassley, should violate the Electoral Count Act. When he gets to Arizona, he announces that he has multiple slates of electors, and so is going to defer decision on that until finishing the other states, Eastman wrote. This would be the first break with the procedure set out in the act. This break with procedure that Eastman's memo was openly advocating for was in other words the vice president breaking the law. When Casebra read Eastman's memo, he commented favorably, declaring it, are really awesome. At this point, Eastman continued, Congress would likely follow the process set forth in the Electoral Count Act, and the two houses, would, break into their separate chambers for debate. But Eastman advised we should not allow the Electoral Count Act constraint on debate to control and the Trump team should demand normal rules, which includes the filibuster. Eastman thought this would create a stalemate, giving the state legislatures more time to weigh in to formally support the alternate slate of electors, if they had not already done so. As discussed previously in this report, at the time he drafted this memo, and throughout the post-election period, Eastman, Giuliani, President Trump and others were simultaneously working to replace certified electors for former Vice President Biden in certain states. Eastman, Giuliani, and President Trump all pressured state legislators to name their own separate electors or to certify the campaign's fake electors. Eastman's theory was, in the words of President Trump's senior White House and campaign officials, insane. Crazy. Nutty and it would never practically work. Eric Hirschman an attorney working for President Trump in the White House, met with Eastman to discuss his memo. Hirschman thought Eastman's plan was crazy. Hirschman summarized the conversation to the select committee. And I said to him, hold on a second, I want to understand what you're saying. You're saying you believe the vice president, acting as president of the Senate, can be the sole decision maker as to, under your theory, who becomes the next president of the United States. And he said, yes. And I said, are you out of your effing mind, right? And that was pretty blunt. I said, you're completely crazy. You're going to turn around and tell 78 plus million people in this country that your theory is, this is how you're going to invalidate their votes because you think the election was stolen? I said, they're not going to tolerate that. I said, you're going to cause riots in the streets. 
and he said words to the effect of there's been violence in this history of our country to protect the democracy or to protect the, our public. As recounted by Hirschman, Eastman was shockingly unconcerned with the prospect of violence should Vice President Pence follow his and President Trump's recommended course. Hirschman asked a straightforward question, if the states wanted to recertify their electors, then why weren't they doing it themselves? Why aren't they already coming into session and saying, we want to change the, estates, and why do you need the VP to go down this path? Eastman had no response. In addition to being crazy, Hirschman didn't think there was any chance in the world that Eastman's plan could work. Hirschman pressed Eastman further asking if he had any precedent at all for the VP or anyone acting in the capacity as the president of the Senate declaring some statute invalid. Eastman replied no, but argued that these are unprecedented times. Hirschman was unimpressed, calling this a ridiculous answer. White House counsel Pasquale Anthony Patsipoloni thought the Eastman plan was nutty. Trump campaign official Jason Miller testified that the campaign's general counsel, Matt Morgan, and deputy campaign manager, Justin Clark, thought Eastman was crazy, understood that there was no validity to, his theory, in any way, shape, or form, and shared their views with anyone who would listen. The vice president's conclusion that he did not have the ability to affect the outcome of the election. Vice President Pence's counsel, Greg Jacob, was simultaneously researching the role of the vice president during the joint session. The office of the vice president produced a preliminary staff memo on the subject on October 26, 2020. Jacob then discussed the matter with Mark Short on election day or the day before. This wasn't the first time Jacob would be required to write a memo about the vice president's role in the electoral process. Before the election, Short explained to him that some in the White House were encouraging President Trump to prematurely declare victory on election night. Of course, that is exactly what President Trump did. Jacob and Short wanted to avoid the vice president getting drawn into any such declarations, and Jacob pointed to his role in presiding over the counting of the electoral votes on January 6 as a reason not to. Jacob sent a memo to Short on Election Day reflecting this advice. Then, on December 7, 2020, the Lincoln Project aired a provocative ad taunting President Trump, saying that Vice President Pence will put the nail in your political coffin during the joint session on January 6. This prompted a discussion between Jacob and Vice President Pence. Jacob authored another memo, dated December 8, 2020. Jacob continued researching the Vice President's role during the joint session into early January. Jacob told the Select Committee that his view of the matter was not fully formed until then. Jacob did extensive research on an historical analysis of both the Electoral Count Act of 1887 and the Twelfth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. The Twelfth Amendment contains a single relevant line, the President of the Senate shall, in the presence of the Senate and House of Representatives, open all the certificates, and the votes shall then be counted. Though Jacob concluded that this line was inartfully drafted, it said nothing about resolving disputes over electoral votes. Jacob concluded that the Vice President must adhere to the Electoral Count Act. The ESA has been followed for 130 years and every single time that there has been any objection to electors, it has been resolved in accordance with the Electoral Count Act procedures, Jacob testified. After reviewing the history and relevant cases, Jacob found that, d here is no justifiable basis to conclude that the vice president has that kind of authority to affect the outcome of the presidential election. Jacob stated that his review of text, history, and, frankly, just common sense all confirmed that the vice president had no such power. Image, Greg Jacob testifies before the Select Committee on June 16, 2022. Photo by House Creative Services. President Trump's allies filed lawsuits seeking a court order directing Vice President Pence not to count certain electoral votes. One of President Trump's congressional allies, Rep. Louis Gohmert, RTX, pushed a version of Eastman's theory in the courts. On December 27, 2020, Representative Gohmert and several of the Trump campaign's fake electors for the state of Arizona, including Republican Party Chair Kelly Ward, filed suit against Vice President Pence in the U.S. District Court for the Eastern District of Texas. As Ward explained to Mark Short in a phone call the day the suit was filed, President Trump was aware of the lawsuit and had signed off on it, we wouldn't have done that without the president telling us it was okay, she told him.
In the suit, the plaintiffs alleged that there were competing slates of electors from five states. They asked the court to rule that portions of the Electoral Count Act of 1887 were unconstitutional and that the Twelfth Amendment contains the exclusive dispute resolution mechanisms for determining an objection raised by a member of Congress to the electors submitted by any state. Essentially, Rep. Gohmert was asking the court to tell Vice President Pence that he was prohibited from following the procedures set forth in the Electoral Count Act. Image, Rep. Louis Gohmert outside the Capitol on March 17, 2021. Photo by Chip Sumata Villa slash Getty Images. Much like Eastman's theory, the Gohmert plaintiffs asserted that the Vice President has the exclusive authority and sole discretion to determine which electoral votes to count. Although the Gohmert suit was premised on the same theory Eastman advocated, Eastman did not agree with the decision to file suit. Eastman argued that filing a suit against the vice president had close, to zero chance of succeeding, and there was a very high risk that the court would issue an opinion stating that Pence has no authority to reject the Biden certified ballots. As highlighted by Judge Carter, Eastman's theory was that Vice President Pence should take this action without asking for permission from Congress or the courts. Another attorney, Bill Olson, stated that getting a judicial determination that Pence is constrained by, the Electoral Count Act could completely tank the January 6th strategy. Those who were advocating to press on with the Eastman scheme did not want to bring it before a federal judge because of the high risk that a court's determination that the scheme was illegal would stop the plan to overturn the election dead in its tracks. Image, John McKenty, February 28, 2020. Photo by Alex Wong slash Getty Images. Eastman himself pushed this cavalier attitude towards the courts and compliance with the law during a call with Arizona House Speaker Rusty Bowers on January 4. During this call, just two days before the joint session, Eastman pressed Speaker Bowers to bring the Arizona House into session to certify Trump electors or decertify the Biden electors. Speaker Bowers responded as he had previously responded to similar entreaties by Giuliani and President Trump, by explaining that doing so would require him to violate his oaths to the U.S. and Arizona constitutions and that he wasn't going to take such an action. Undeterred, Eastman still pushed Speaker Bowers to just do it and let the court sort it through. Ultimately, Rep. Gohmert's legal gambit failed, a U.S. district judge dismissed the case quickly. The judge's ruling was upheld by the Supreme Court, which rejected Gohmert's appeal without further consideration. Other individuals advising President Trump and his campaign also advocated for a role for the vice president at the joint session. Other individuals inside and outside the White House also advanced versions of the theory that the vice president had agency in the joint session. The issue of Vice President Pence's role came up during a December meeting in the Oval Office. Either President Trump or his chief of staff, Mark Meadows, asked John McKenty, the director of the presidential personnel office, with researching the matter further. Though McKendy was one of President Trump's close advisors, he was not a lawyer and had no relevant experience. Yet, he wrote a one-page memo claiming that the VP has substantial discretion to address issues with the electoral process. This wasn't the only one-page analysis drafted by McKendy before January 6. He later proposed a middle path in which he envisioned the vice president accepting only half the electoral votes from six disputed states, specifically, Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Georgia, Arizona and Nevada. McKinney portrayed this as a way to avoid disenfranchising, states while still achieving the desired result, delivering a second term to President Trump. McKinney conveyed this memo to the president with a cover note reading, This is probably our only realistic option because it would give Pence an out. McKinney told the select committee that this judgment was based on his assessment that it was, like, pretty obvious, the vice president, wasn't going to just reject the electors or whatever was being asked of him at that time. Another advocate of a plan for the vice president to play a role in the joint session was Jenna Ellis, a lawyer working for the Trump campaign. She argued in two memos that Vice President Pence had the power to delay the counting of certified electoral votes. In the first memo, addressed to President Trump and dated December 31, 2020, Ellis advised that Vice President Pence should not open any of the votes from six states that currently have electoral delegates in dispute. Ellis asserted that this dispute provided sufficient rational and legal basis to question whether the state law and constitution was followed. Ellis proposed a delay of 10 days, as the Vice President and Congress awaited a response from the 
s state legislatures, which would then need to meet in an emergency electoral session. If any of the state legislatures fails to provide a timely response, no electoral votes can be opened and counted from that, s state. Ellis claimed that Vice President Pence would not be exercising discretion nor establishing new precedent, but instead simply asking for clarification from the constitutionally appointed authority. Image, Jen Ellis on December 2, 2020 in Lansing, Michigan. Photo by Ray Del Rio slash Getty Images. Ellis sent the substance of this memorandum in an email to Fox News host Janine Pirro on January 1, 2021, under the subject line Constitutional Option. And, on January 4, 2021, she sent the same substance to Fox News contributor John Solomon under the subject line Pence Option. Ellis addressed a second memo, dated January 5, 2021, to Jay Sekulow, an outside attorney who represented President Trump during his first impeachment proceedings and in other litigation. Ellis again claimed that Vice President Pence had the power to delay the certification of the vote. Ellis recommended that the vice president should, when he arrived at the first contested state, Arizona, simply stop the count on the basis that the states had not made a final determination of ascertainment of electors. The states would therefore have to act. Sekula clearly disagreed. Some have speculated that the vice president could simply say, I'm not going to accept these electors, that he has the authority to do that under the Constitution, Sekulow said during an episode of his radio show. I actually don't think that's what the Constitution has in mind. Sekulow added that the vice president serves a merely ministerial, procedural function. In addition, Hirschman discussed this memo with Sekulow. They agreed that Ellis did not have the qualifications or the experience to be giving advice on this or to be litigating the challenges that President Trump's team was filing in court. Hirschman did not think that Sekulow shared the memo with the president. 5.2 President Trump and his allies exert intense public and private pressure on the vice president in advance of the joint session of Congress on January 6. January 2, 2021 the vice president meets with his advisors, cementing his intended path for the joint session. On January 2, 2021, Vice President Pence met with his counsel Greg Jacob, Chief of Staff Mark Short, and Matt Morgan to discuss the joint session. Morgan was the Trump campaign's general counsel and had previously served as counsel to Vice President Pence. At this point, the vice president already had a clear understanding of what his role would be in the electoral count. Vice President Pence was concerned that most people did not understand how the certification of the electoral votes worked. So Jacob began drafting a statement for the vice president to issue on January 6. The statement was intended to provide a civic education on the joint session, explaining to the American people his actions, including why the vice president didn't have the authorities that others had suggested that he might. The men discussed the various points of pressure being applied to the vice president, including Eastman's theories, the Gomert suit, Ellis's arguments, as well as how the electoral count process should work. They also discussed allegations of irregularities and maladministration of the election, concluding that none of the allegations raised was sufficient to reverse President Trump's defeat. While Vice President Pence recognized Congress's authority under the Electoral Count Act to raise objections to the certification, neither he nor his staff were aware of any evidence of fraud that would have had a material effect on the outcome of the election in any state. Because of President Trump's repetition of election fraud allegations, Jacob and the Vice President's staff conducted their own evaluation of these claims. Jacob asked Morgan to send the campaign's best evidence of election fraud, maladministration, irregularities, and, abuses in the system. The vice president's legal staff memorialized the review they conducted of these materials in a memo to Vice President Pence, which concluded, most allegations of substantive voter fraud, defined to mean the casting of illegal ballots in violation of prevailing election laws, are either relatively small in number, or cannot be verified. Vice President Pence also discussed the Trump campaign's fake electors with his advisors. Both Jacob and Morgan assured Vice President Pence that there were not dual slates of electors. The electors organized by the Trump campaign were not valid. Morgan had already written a memo on the topic in December, concluding that the alternate electors, that is, fake, lacked a certificate of ascertainment issued by the state. Without such an ascertainment, the Trump campaign's fake electors had no standing during the joint session. Jacob had also prepared a flowchart memo outlining each of the legal provisions implicated in the joint session on January 6.
Jacob advised Vice President Pence that none of the slates that had been sent in would qualify as an alternate slate within the meaning of the Electoral Count Act. Vice President Pence was still worried that the fake elector issue was sowing confusion, so he wanted his statement on January 6 to be as transparent as possible. That same day, January 2, Mark Short released a brief statement on behalf of the Vice President. Vice President Pence shares the concerns of millions of Americans about voter fraud and irregularities in the last election, the statement read. The Vice President welcomes the efforts of members of the House and Senate to use the authority they have under the law to raise objections and bring forward evidence before the Congress and the American people on January 6. Short testified that the statement was consistent with the Vice President's view that he did not have the power to reject electors. Short issued this statement because of the swirl regarding the question of where, Vice President Pence, stood. Steve Bannon's podcast, War Room, Pandemic, was one of the primary sources of this swirl. January 2, 2021, Eastman and Bannon question the courage and spine of Vice President Pence. Steve Bannon's podcast, War Room, Pandemic, was one of the primary sources of this swirl. Eastman was a guest on a January 2 episode of Bannon's show. Much of their conversation focused on Vice President Pence and the belief that he had the power to overturn the election. We are entering into one of the most, um, important constitutional crisis, sick, the country's ever had, Bannon said. Bannon complained that Vice President Pence had spit the bit, meaning he had given up on efforts to keep President Trump in power. Eastman claimed that the election had been illegally conducted, and so the certified votes now devolved back to the, S state legislature s and the only other place where it devolved back to is to Congress and particularly the Vice President, who will sit in presiding over a joint session of Congress beginning on January 6 to count the ballots. Eastman claimed that the Vice President, and Congress, had the power to reject the certified electors from several states out of hand. T. have got multiple slates of ballots from seven states, Eastman said. And they've got to decide, which is the valid slate to count, I think they have that authority to make that determination on their own. Bannon claimed the Vice President of the United States is hardwired in, and an actual decision maker. The Vice President's role is not ministerial, Bannon declared. Eastman agreed. Are we to assume that this is going to be a climactic battle that's going to take place this week about the very question of the constitutionality of the Electoral Count Act of 1887? Bannon asked. Eastman replied, I think a lot of that depends on the courage and the spine of the individuals involved. Bannon asked Eastman if he meant Vice President Mike Pence. Yes, Eastman answered. January 3, 2021, Eastman drafts another January 6 scenario memo war gaming the ways that Vice President Pence could change the outcome of the election. The next day, January 3, 2021, Eastman drafted a six-page memo that imagined several scenarios for January 6, only some of which led to President Trump's victory. In a section titled, Wargaming the Alternatives, Eastman set forth the ways he thought President Trump could remain in power. Importantly, Eastman concluded that President Trump could remain president if, and only if, Vice President Pence followed Eastman's illegal advice and determined which electoral college ballots were valid. In another scenario, Eastman imagined that President Trump may somehow win re-election in January 2021 if Vice President Pence remanded the electoral votes to state legislatures, such that they could have 10 days to investigate President Trump's baseless claims of fraud. In that case, Eastman allowed that former Vice President Biden may still win, should the state legislatures determine that the evidence was insufficient to alter the results of the election. Eastman knew that there were no valid alternate slates but he nonetheless predicated his advice to the vice president and president on this claim. In his six-page memo, consistent with the earlier two-page memo, Eastman states that the Trump electors met and transmitted votes, finding that, d here are thus dual slates of electors from seven, s states. Even since January 6, Eastman has continued to affirm and defend his assertion that there were dual slates of electors, writing, Trump electors from seven, Estates in which election challenges were still pending met, albeit of their own accord, on the date designated by Congress, cast their votes, and transmitted those votes to Congress. Eastman used these slates as a premise for his argument that the result of the election was disputed. However, Eastman acknowledged on multiple occasions, both before and after January 6, 
that these dual slates had no legal significance. In an email sent on December 19, 2020, Eastman wrote that the seven Trump-slash-Pence slates of electors will be dead on arrival in Congress unless those electors get a certification from their state legislators. Of course, this certification never came and there was no basis for any action on the dual slates. Nevertheless, on December 23, 2020, Eastman used the existence of these slates as a justification for the vice president to act, in an email to Boris Epstein, a Trump campaign lawyer. The fact that we have multiple slates of electors demonstrates the uncertainty of either. That should be enough. Again after January 6, Eastman acknowledged in an email that the fake electors documents were invalid and irrelevant. Alas, he said, D. Hay had no authority because, no legislature certified them, Eastman concluded his memo by asserting that his plan was bold, certainly, but he attempted to justify it arguing that this election was stolen by a strategic Democrat plan to systematically flout existing election laws for partisan advantage, we're no longer playing by Queensbury rules, therefore. Eastman repeated what he wrote in his earlier, shorter memo, claiming that Vice President Pence should act without asking for permission, either from a vote of the joint session or from the court. Eastman claimed that the Constitution assigns this power to the Vice President as the ultimate arbiter. Eastman ended on an especially hyperbolic note. If the election's results were not upended, then the sovereign people no longer control the direction of their government, and we will have ceased to be a self-governing people. The stakes could not be higher. January 4, 2021, President Trump and Eastman meet with Pence and his staff in the Oval Office. Eastman argues in an Oval Office meeting that the vice president can reject electoral votes or that he can delay the certification, sending the electoral votes back to the states. Late in the afternoon of January 4, 2021, President Trump summoned Vice President Pence to the Oval Office for a showdown. President Trump and Eastman sought to convince the vice president that he had the power to refuse to count the certified electors from several states won by former Vice President Biden. Short and Jacob attended with the vice president. Trump's chief of staff, Mark Meadows, was only briefly present, leaving as the meeting started. The White House counsel is excluded from the meeting. One key lawyer was conspicuously absent, Pat Cipollone, the White House counsel. Cipollone and his deputy, Pat Philbin, were shooting down a series of terrible proposals at the time. Philbin told the select committee that he considered resigning every day from approximately November 15 until the end of the administration. Philbin had researched the vice president's role in the January 6 joint session and concluded that Vice President Pence had no power to affect the outcome. Cipollone agreed and informed Short and Jacob that this was the opinion of White House Counsel's office. Mark Meadows invited Cipollone to speak with Eastman prior to the Oval Office meeting. Cipollone told Eastman that his scheme was not something that is consistent with the appropriate reading of the law. After delivering this assessment directly to Eastman in Meadows' office, Cipollone walked to the Oval Office with the intent to attend the meeting. However, by the time the vice president and his staff arrived, Cipollone was gone. Cipollone declined to testify as to what he told President Trump or why he did not attend the Oval Office meeting but he was clear that he didn't end up attending the meeting because of something that happened after he walked into the Oval Office. Whatever happened, Cipollone maintained, was protected by executive privilege, suggesting that he was asked to leave by the president. What is clear, however, is that Cipollone had already shared his view directly with Meadows and Eastman, i.e., that the proposal President Trump and Eastman were about to advocate to the vice president was illegal. During this Oval Office meeting, Eastman admits that both paths are based on the same legal theory and concedes his plan violates the Electoral Count Act. During the Oval Office meeting, Eastman claimed that there were two legally viable options. First, Vice President Pence could reject outright the certified electors submitted by several states, and second, he could suspend the joint session and send the disputed electoral votes back to the states. Eastman advised that the Vice President had the raw authority to determine objections himself according to Jacob. However, by the end of the meeting Eastman was emphasizing the second option that he argued would be more politically palatable than the more aggressive option of the vice president rejecting electoral votes outright. If Vice President Pence did not want to reject the electors, Eastman claimed, then the vice president could send the certified electoral votes back to the states for further deliberation. 
Eastman later conceded that both actions were based on the same underlying legal theory of the vice president's power. Image, Pat Cipollone is seen on a screen during a select committee hearing on July 12, 2022. Photo by Sarah Silbiger Pool slash Getty Images. Eastman also admitted, during this meeting with the president and vice president, that his proposal violated the Electoral Count Act. Moreover, Eastman eventually acknowledged that the concept of the vice president unilaterally rejecting electors was not supported by precedent and that the Supreme Court would never endorse it. Jacob recorded his reflections on the January 4 meeting in a contemporaneous memo to the vice president. Jacob's memo confirms that Eastman admitted that his proposal violated the law in the presence of President Trump. First, Jacob wrote, Eastman acknowledged that his proposal violates several provisions of statutory law namely, the Electoral Count Act of 1887. Jacob's memo explains that the Electoral Count Act calls for all vote certificates to be acted upon, and any objections to a state's certificates be finally disposed of. However, as Jacob wrote, Eastman was proposing instead that no action be taken on the certificates from the states Eastman asserted were contested. And, according to the Electoral Count Act, the vice president, as president of the Senate, is to call for objections. But Eastman did not want the vice president to call for objections for these states. As Jacob noted, this would have deprived Congress of the ability under the act to make, debate, and vote on objections. Additionally, the Electoral Count Act contains a provision that requires any competing slates of electors to be submitted to the Senate and House for debate and disposition. As Jacob noted, Eastman conceded that the alternate, fake, electors' votes were not proper. But Eastman's proposal still would have refused to count the real electors' votes from those states and instead referred both the real and fake electors' votes to state legislatures for disposition. Finally, in order for state legislatures to take action to determine which of the slates should be counted, Eastman's proposal called for an extended recess of the joint session. But this too would have violated the Electoral Count Act, which provides only for very short delays. There was another foundational problem with Eastman's plan. There were no legitimate competing or alternate slates of electors. President Trump, Eastman and others had manufactured the conditions they needed in order to claim that the election result was disputed by convening fake electors who sent fake documents to Washington before January 6. And their efforts to convince state legislatures to certify Trump electors had already failed. Jacob noted in his memo that in the Oval Office meeting, Eastman conceded no legislature has appointed or certified any alternate slate of electors and that the purported alternate slates, fake electors, were illegitimate without what Jacob described as the imprimatur of approval by a state legislature. Moreover, Eastman acknowledged that no Republican-controlled legislative majority in any disputed states has expressed an intention to designate an alternate slate of electors. In other words, Eastman acknowledged that the fake votes were invalid, that no state legislature had approved them, and no state legislature would approve them. But President Trump and Eastman still pressed this unlawful scheme on the vice president. Although Eastman started the January 4 Oval Office meeting maintaining that Vice President Pence had unilateral authority to reject electors, by the end of the meeting he conceded that he would not recommend that the Vice President assert that he has the authority unilaterally to decide which of the competing slates of electors should be counted. Jacob ended his memo with a scathing summary. If the Vice President implemented Professor Eastman's proposal, he would likely lose in court, Jacob wrote. In a best-case scenario in which the courts refuse to get involved, the vice president would likely find himself in an isolated standoff against both houses of Congress, as well as most or all of the applicable state legislatures, with no neutral arbiter to break the impasse. Following the Oval Office meeting, during the evening of January 4, 2021, Jacob invited Eastman to send along any written materials on electoral vote counting issues, including a law review article by Lawrence Tribe that Eastman had cited in the Oval Office meeting that day, for Jacob to review on the vice president's behalf. Jacob reviewed everything that Eastman submitted, nothing changed the analysis he had already done for the vice president, indeed much of it did not even support Eastman's own arguments. The vice president was not persuaded by Eastman's theory and remained convinced that his role at the joint session would be merely ceremonial. Pence did not relent on January 4, or at any point during the harrowing two days that followed. From my very first conversation with the vice president on the subject, 
his immediate instinct was that there is no way that one person could be entrusted by the framers to exercise that authority, Jacob testified. And never once did I see him budge from that view, and the legal advice that I provided him merely reinforced it. So, everything that he said or did during, the January 4th meeting in the Oval Office, was consistent with his first instincts on this question. January 4, 2021, President Trump publicly pressures the vice president during a rally speech in Georgia. President Trump did not relent either. His instinct was to increase public pressure on Vice President Pence, despite the vice president's consistent message to President Trump about the limits of his authority. That evening, during a Senate campaign rally in Dalton, Georgia, President Trump made it seem as if the presidential election hadn't already been decided and projected his unhinged ambitions onto his opponents. President Trump claimed that there's nothing the radical Democrats will not do to get power that they so desperately crave, including the outright stealing of elections, like they're trying to do with us. We're not going to let it happen, President Trump said, adding, I hope Mike Pence comes through for us, I have to tell you. President Trump called Vice President Pence a great vice president, a great guy, as well as a wonderful and smart man. But he alluded to the vice president's role, he's going to have a lot to say about it, and added an ominous note. Of course, if he doesn't come through, I won't like him quite as much, President Trump said. January 5, 2021, Eastman pressures Pence's staff in a private meeting while President Trump tweets. In the reversal of where the Oval Office meeting ended the day before, Eastman argues that Pence should reject electors outright. Eastman met with Jacob and Short again the following day. During the Oval Office meeting the vice president had made clear that he would not unilaterally reject electors, and, by pivoting to recommend the vice president send the electors back to the states, Eastman seemed to recognize this. But the following morning, Eastman returned to pressing for the more aggressive path. Jacob recorded Eastman's request on January 5, 2021, in a handwritten note, requesting VP reject. Jacob later summarized Eastman's remarks as follows, I'm here asking you to reject the electors. This overnight reversal surprised Jacob because Eastman was returning to the more aggressive position he had seemed to abandon in the Oval Office meeting the day before. President Trump's tweets that morning may explain Eastman's reversal. While Eastman was meeting with the vice president's staff, his client, President Trump, was pressing the argument publicly. At 11.06 a.m. on the morning of January 5, President Trump tweeted, The vice president has the power to reject fraudulently chosen electors. As his tweet made clear, President Trump would not be persuaded by reason, or the law. The president made this public statement despite the vice president's clear and consistent rejection of this theory including during an in-person meeting the day before. During that same meeting, Eastman conceded that this aggressive path of rejecting electors was not advisable. Hirschman briefly participated in the January 5th meeting, seeing it as an opportunity, to just chew, Eastman, out. Hirschman had already pushed back brutally, on Eastman's theory regarding the vice president. In this conversation, he emphasized the need to fact-check dubious claims of election fraud. Hirschman told Eastman that someone better make sure that the allegations Eastman provided to members of Congress were accurate before they objected to the certification of the vote the next day. And nothing should come out of someone's mouth that, isn't, independently verified and, reliable. At the end of the morning meeting, Eastman concedes to Pence's counsel that his theory has no historical support. Jacob then had his own Socratic debate with Eastman over the legal merits of his position. According to Jacob, Eastman conceded much ground by the end of the session. Eastman all but admitted that it, his plan, didn't work. For example, Eastman had previously claimed to have found historical support in the actions of John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, who both presided over the counting of electoral votes when they were vice president. Not so. Jacob told the select committee that Eastman conceded in private that the cases of Jefferson and Adams did not serve as examples for the proposition that he was trying to support of a vice presidential assertion of authority to decide disputes, because no dispute was raised in either case during the joint session. Jacob added, and, moreover, there was no, question, as to the outcomes in those states. Eastman conceded that there was no historical support for the role that he and President Trump were pushing Vice President Pence to play. No vice president, before or after the adoption of the Electoral Count Act, 
had ever exercised such authority. This included then-Vice President Richard Nixon's handling of the electoral votes of Hawaii following the 1960 election. Though Eastman and other Trump lawyers use this Hawaii example to justify the theory that the vice president could unilaterally choose which electors to count, Eastman admitted to Jacob that Vice President Nixon had not in fact done what Eastman was recommending Vice President Pence do. Eastman also admitted that he would not grant the expansive powers he advocated for Vice President Pence to any other vice president. Eastman did not think that Vice President Kamala Harris should have such power in 2025, nor did he think that Vice President Al Gore should have had such authority in 2001. He also acknowledged that his theory would lose 9-0 at the Supreme Court. Image, Judge J. Michael Ludwig testifies before the Select Committee on June 16, 2022. Photo by House Creative Services According to Jacob, Eastman acknowledged by the end that, first of all, no reasonable person would actually want that clause, of the Twelfth Amendment, read that way because if indeed it did mean that the vice president had such authority, you could never have a party switch thereafter. If politicians followed Eastman's advice, why you would just have the same party win continuously if indeed a vice president had the authority to just declare the winner of every state. The vice president's office was unmoved by Eastman's specious reasoning. As he left Mark Short's office, Eastman was thinking of his client's reaction. They're going to be really disappointed that I wasn't able to persuade you, Eastman said. Former Republican officials with executive, legislative, and judicial experience all agreed with Vice President Pence's conclusion about his limited role at the joint session. As President Trump's pressure campaign intensified, the vice president's outside counsel, Richard Cullen, turned for support to John Michael Ludwig, a conservative former judge of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit. Eastman had clerked for Ludwig, a man with impeccable legal and conservative credentials, more than two decades prior. Ludwig rejected Eastman's so-called legal analysis of the vice president's role in no uncertain terms. In a series of tweets, posted at 9.53 a.m. on January 5, Ludwig set forth his legal conclusions. The only responsibility and power of the vice president under the Constitution is to faithfully count the electoral college votes as they have been cast, Judge Ludwig wrote. The Constitution does not empower the vice president to alter in any way the votes that have been cast, either by rejecting certain of them or otherwise. Confusion in the media about where the vice president stood on this issue prompted former Speaker of the House Paul Ryan to reach out to the vice president to share his belief that the vice president had no unilateral authority. Short also spoke with former Speaker Ryan and as he testified to the Select Committee, I said to him, Mr. Speaker, you know Mike, you know he recognizes that. And we sort of laughed about it, and he said, I get it. The Vice President also consulted with former Vice President Dan Quayle, who reinforced and affirmed Vice President Pence's consistent understanding of his role. January 5, 2021 President Trump again pressures Vice President Pence in a one-on-one -on -one meeting at the White House and another phone call with Eastman. President Trump demanded to see Vice President Pence again that same day. Vice President Pence had canceled a planned lunch with President Trump, intending to work on the statement he planned to issue on January 6 to explain publicly why he wouldn't bow to the president's pressure. But Pence couldn't avoid Trump. Vice President Pence had to delay a coronavirus task force meeting later that same day when he was called to the Oval Office to meet with the president. The two men met alone, without staff present. While we have not developed direct evidence of what was discussed during this one-on-one -on -one meeting between the president and vice president, it did not change the fundamental disagreement between them about the limits of the vice president's authority during the joint session. Jacob said the vice president left the meeting determined. Vice President Pence did tell Mark Short what transpired during the meeting, but Short refused to tell the select committee what was said. Short described Vice President Pence's demeanor as steady. Short testified that the below excerpt from the book Peril may have been sensationalized but was generally consistent with Short's understanding of the discussion. If these people say you have the power, wouldn't you want to? Trump asked. I wouldn't want any one person to have that authority. Pence said. But wouldn't it almost be cool to have that power? Trump asked. No, Pence said. Look, I've read this, and I don't see a way to do it. 
We've exhausted every option. I've done everything I could and then some to find a way around this. It's simply not possible. My interpretation is, no. No, 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 Trump shouted. You don't understand, Mike. You can do this. I don't want to be your friend anymore if you don't do this. Later that day, Jacob and Short were both present for a call between President Trump and Vice President Pence. Eastman and at least one other lawyer were with President Trump on the call as well. Eastman recognized that Vice President Pence was not going to change his mind on rejecting electors outright, but he still asked if the Vice President would consider sending the electors back to the states. I don't see it, Vice President Pence responded, but my counsel will hear out whatever Mr. Eastman has to say. Jacob received other calls from Eastman on January 5. Jacob told the select committee that he had a detailed discussion with Eastman concerning the ways his proposal would violate the Electoral Count Act. Eastman resorted to a ridiculous argument, comparing their current situation to the crisis that faced President Abraham Lincoln during the Civil War. Eastman invoked President Lincoln's suspension of the writ of habeas corpus. He also told Jacob to stay tuned because we were trying to get some letters from state legislators indicating that they were interested in the vice president sending the electors back to the states. January 5, 2021, an accurate New York Times article about the vice president prompts a false statement in response by President Trump. On the evening of January 5, the New York Times published an article titled, Pence said to have told Trump he lacks power to change an election result. The Times reported on the tension brewing within the White House, citing people briefed on the conversation between President Trump and Vice President Pence that had taken place in the Oval Office the previous day. Vice President Mike Pence told President Trump on Tuesday, January 4, that he did not believe he had the power to block congressional certification of Joseph R. Biden Jr.'s victory in the presidential election despite Mr. Trump's baseless insistence that he did, the Times reported. The Times report was published at approximately 7.36 that evening. Jason Miller called President Trump to make sure he had seen it. President Trump spoke to Miller at least twice, once at 8.18 p.m. and a second time at 9.22 p.m. Immediately after concluding his second call with Jason Miller, President Trump asked to speak to the vice president. President Trump and Vice President Pence spoke from 9.33 to 9.41 p.m. President Trump also spoke with Steve Bannon and Eastman, among others. At 9.58 p.m. on January 5, President Trump issued a statement that he had dictated to Jason Miller disputing the Times account. President Trump lied, repeatedly, in his short statement. The president claimed the article was fake news. It wasn't. President Trump claimed he and Vice President Pence were in total agreement that the vice president has the power to act. They weren't. President Trump claimed the election was illegal. It wasn't. President Trump then laid out Vice President Pence's options for the next day. Summarizing Eastman's theory Our vice president has several options under the U.S. Constitution. He can decertify the results or send them back to the estates for change and certification. He can also decertify the illegal and corrupt results and send them to the House of Representatives for the one vote for one estate tabulation. This was also a blatant attempt to mischaracterize the vice president's position in the hope that public opinion would somehow sway the resolute vice president. President Trump knew full well at the time that he and Vice President Pence were not in total agreement. The vice president's counsel, Greg Jacob, was shocked by the statement. T. He vice president was not in agreement that the vice president had the power to take the actions that were being asked of him that day, Jacob later told the select committee. Mark Short was furious as well and called Jason Miller to forcefully express his displeasure that a statement could have gone out that misrepresented the vice president's viewpoint without consultation. The vice president was obviously irritated that a statement putting words in his mouth was issued by the president and considered issuing his own statement contradicting President Trump's. Ultimately, Pence and Short concluded that it was not worthwhile since it was already late in the evening and they expected the question to be resolved by Vice President Pence's dear colleague letter the next day. January 5, 2021, Bannon publicly amplifies the pressure on Vice President Pence. While President Trump misrepresented the vice president's agreement with Eastman's theory, his on-again, off-again political advisor, Steve Bannon, pressed President Trump's campaign against Vice President Pence in public. 
Bannon echoed the public pressure on Pence that the president continued to propagate by talking about his purported authority. The select committee learned from phone records that Bannon spoke to President Trump at least twice on January 5. During a January 5, 2021, episode of War Room, Pandemic, Bannon and his guests openly berated Vice President Pence. Bannon cited an erroneous news report claiming that Senator Grassley would preside over the certification of the Electoral College vote, instead of Vice President Pence. Bannon's co-host, Raheem Kassam, took credit for the public pressure placed on Vice President Pence. I want to remind people who has been sitting here, saying light Pence up for the last couple of weeks. Right? That would be Raheem Kassam. They then discuss President Trump's speech in Georgia the previous evening. I think the President of the United States took your advice last night, wrote a line in there, Bannon said. To which Kassim responded, and yours, hold the line. Jack Posobiec an alt-right personality with a large Twitter following, chimed in quoting a member of their audience as saying that Pence will betray Donald Trump. In response, Bannon stated, Call the play. Run the play. The play was Bannon's version of the Green Bay Sweep A plan to subvert the transfer of power on January 6 named for a brutally effective power-running play developed in the National Football League NFL, in the 1960s. Steve Bannon's political version of the sweep was intended to undermine the legitimate results of the 2020 presidential election. One account of Bannon's Green Bay sweep comes from Peter Navarro, director of the White House Office of Trade and Manufacturing Policy. Navarro refused to cooperate with the select committee and was subsequently indicted for contempt of Congress. Although he doesn't fully explain in his book, In Trump Time, A Journal of America's Plague Year, how Bannon's sweep was intended to work, Navarro writes that Vice President Pence was envisioned as the quarterback who would assert his constitutional power to delay certification. Navarro writes that his own role was to carefully document the fraud and myriad election irregularities, while Bannon's role was to figure out how to use this information, what he called the receipts. Navarro's account helps explain why Trump and his loyalists became so fixated on Vice President Pence. They saw Vice President Pence as their last hope for keeping President Trump in office. Navarro writes of Pence's supposed betrayal. In a telling sentence, Navarro likens Vice President Pence to Brutus, a Roman politician and the most famous assassin of Julius Caesar. Navarro writes, On this cold, momentous day, I shiver as I think to myself, January 6 will be either Mike Pence's finest hour or the traitor is set to, Brute? End of both his and Donald Trump's political careers. The goal of these Trump allies was clear, to overturn the election result. Statements by participants in this effort indicate there were several different endgame strategies in mind. One was to get the vice president to unilaterally reject the Electoral College votes of Arizona, Georgia, Pennsylvania, and other states, then simply declare that Trump had won a majority of the electors actually submitted. The other major possibility was to reject or return the Electoral College votes of these states and then declare there was no majority in the Electoral College process thereby triggering a so-called contingent election under the Twelfth Amendment. This would have meant that the House of Representatives had chosen the president not on the basis of one member one vote, but on the basis of one state one vote, pursuant to the Twelfth Amendment. Donald Trump's strategists emphasized repeatedly that the GOP had a 27-22 margin in control of the state's congressional delegations, with Pennsylvania being tied at 9-9, therefore presumably a non-factor. 5.3 President Trump and his allies continue to pressure the vice president on January 6, threatening his life and our democracy. January 6, 2021, President Trump continued to falsely assert in multiple tweets posted the morning of January 6 that the vice president had a role to play in the outcome of the election. Despite the public pressure initiated by the president and amplified by Bannon, Navarro and others, there was no ambiguity in the vice president's decision. By January 6, President Trump had been told multiple times that Vice President Pence was not going to reject the certified electors from any state. Nor was Vice President Pence going to move for a delay and send the electors back to the states. Either move would have been illegal, requiring Vice President Pence to break the law, violating his oath to the U.S. Constitution. Pence made his decision clear, and many times to President Trump, and he was very consistent in rejecting the president's demands. President Trump continued to publicly pressure the vice president anyway. At 1 a.m. on January 6, President Trump tweeted, 
If Vice President at Mike underscore Pence comes through for us, we will win the presidency. Many states want to decertify the mistake they made in certifying incorrect and even fraudulent numbers in a process not approved by their state legislatures, which it must be. Mike can send it back. Later that morning, at 8.17 a.m., President Trump tweeted again. States want to correct their votes, which they now know were based on irregularities and fraud, plus corrupt process never received legislative approval. All Mike Pence has to do is send them back to the states, and we win. Do it Mike, this is a time for extreme courage. And, at 8.22 a.m., President Trump tweeted again, making a pitch for Congress to choose him, as if people's votes on Election Day in the Electoral College didn't matter. The Republican Party and, more importantly, our country, needs the presidency more than ever before, the power of the veto. Stay strong. President Trump's tweets made it clear that he thought the Republican state legislatures would simply deliver him victory. President Trump emphasized this point, writing twice that if Vice President Pence gave in, we win. However, there was no sign of a change in the vice president's position. A moment of truth was looming. January 6, 2021, President Trump has a, a cheated conversation with Vice President Pence before his rally on the ellipse. President Trump tried to reach Vice President Pence by phone early that morning. He finally talked to his vice president at approximately 11.20 a.m. The exchange quickly became contentious. Eric Hirschman, a lawyer in the White House Counsel's Office, overheard the conversation. Members of President Trump's family and other White House officials were present as well. Hirschman recalled that it started off as a calmer tone, everything, and then it became heated. Ivanka Trump also described the call as pretty heated. Ivanka Trump elaborated, it was a different tone than I'd heard him take with the vice president before. Ivanka Trump told her chief of staff, Julie Radford, that her dad had just had an upsetting conversation with the vice president. President Trump had even called Vice President Pence the P-word. Nick Luna, President Trump's personal assistant, commonly known as the body man, was also in the Oval Office during the conversation. Image, President Trump on the phone in the Oval Office. Photo provided to the Select Committee by the National Archives and Records Administration. Luna told the Select Committee that President Trump called Vice President Pence a wimp on the call, with President Trump adding that he made the wrong decision in choosing Pence as his running mate. Keith Kellogg, Vice President Pence's national security adviser, also heard the conversation. President Trump told the vice president that, you know, he has legal authority to send these folks, the electors, back to the respective states, Kellogg told the select committee. President Trump insisted that Vice President Pence had the constitutional authority to reject certain electoral college votes. When Vice President Pence would not budge, President Trump told him you're not tough enough to make the call. But Vice President Pence would not be bullied. The Vice President, who was at his residence at the time, had been meeting with Greg Jacob to finalize the statement he would be releasing later that day. When the President called, Pence stepped away to answer the phone. According to Jacob, when Pence returned, he did not say anything about the call, but he looked steely, determined, and, grim, as he re-entered the room. C. January 6, 2021, Trump Eastman and Giuliani continue to pressure Vice President Pence at the Ellipse rally. Despite the Vice President's unwavering stance, the President and his outside counsel continue to turn up the heat of public pressure. At President Trump's urging, thousands had gathered on the morning of January 6 to hear the President and others speak at a rally held at the Ellipse, a park just south of the White House. Before President Trump spoke, Eastman took the stage alongside Giuliani. Both would further amplify the president's public pressure on the vice president, but when Giuliani spoke on the ellipse, he already knew that what Eastman had outlined would never practically happen. At 9.31 a.m. that morning, Giuliani called Eric Hirschman out of the blue to ask him for his view and analysis of the practical implications of Eastman's theory. According to Hirschman, after an intellectual discussion about the VP's role, Giuliani agreed that the practical implication of what Eastman had proposed would be almost impossible. Immediately after this five-and-a-half-minute conversation with Hirschman, 
Giuliani had two calls with the White House, at 9.41 a.m. and 9.53 a.m. Giuliani recognized Eastman who joined him on stage, claiming that he was one of the preeminent constitutional scholars in the United States. Giuliani said Vice President Pence could either decide on the validity of these crooked ballots, or he can send it back to the legislatures, give them five to ten days to finally finish the work. He added that that they had letters from five legislatures, begging us to do that. This was not true. At most, what Giuliani, Eastman and other allies of President Trump had managed to procure were letters from individual state legislators or groups of state legislators. None of the letters came from a majority of any state's legislative chamber, let alone a majority of an entire state legislature. For instance, a letter that Eastman described to Jacob as a Amajor new development on the evening of January 5 contained the signatures of 21 members of the Pennsylvania Senate. Eastman claimed that it now looks like PA legislature will vote to recertify its electors if Vice President Pence implements the plan we discussed, but the letter asked only for a delay in certification to allow for due process. The select committee learned from the most senior Pennsylvania Senate Republican that he signed the letter because of pressure he was feeling due to the voluminous post-election outreach from President Trump, Trump allies, and the public. And, he only agreed to sign a letter directed to congressional leaders, not the vice president, after raising in a conversation with Vice President Pence's brother, Congressman Greg Pence, his desire to avoid pressuring the vice president. Moreover, as Jacob explained, what any of the state legislatures said they did or did not want to do had no impact on the legal analysis of what the vice president's authorities were. There was simply no legal path to send any votes back to the states on January 6. On the stage at the president's rally on the ellipse, Giuliani repeated a conspiracy theory about the crooked Dominion machines, deliberately changing votes via an algorithm. He explained that the 10-day delay in the certification would be used to see the machines that are crooked and to find criminality there demonstrating that his repeated assertions of a stolen election were not based on any real proof, or even evidence, of actual widespread fraud or criminality. Let's have trial by combat, Giuliani told the crowd. Eastman came to the microphone following Giuliani, and he proceeded to repeat proven falsehoods regarding voting machines. He then issued his demand. And all we are demanding of Vice President Pence is this afternoon, at 1 o'clock, he let the legislatures of the state look into this so we get to the bottom of it, and the American people know whether we have control of the direction of our government, or not. We no longer live in a self-governing republic if we can't get the answer to this question. This is bigger than President Trump. It is a very essence of our Republican form of government, and it has to be done. And anybody that is not willing to stand up to do it, does not deserve to be in the office. It is that simple. Eastman told the assembled crowd that nothing less than the fate of the American Republic was in Vice President Pence's hands. President Trump directs the angry mob at the Capitol to pressure Vice President Pence. When President Trump later took the stage at the Ellipse, he heaped praise on Giuliani and Eastman. He's got guts, unlike a lot of people in the Republican Party, President Trump said of Giuliani. He's got guts. He fights, he fights. President Trump described Eastman as one of the most brilliant lawyers in the country. President Trump claimed that Eastman had looked at the election and said, what an absolute disgrace that this can be happening to our Constitution. Trump falsely argued that the keys to the election were in Vice President Pence's hands, saying. And he, Eastman, looked at Mike Pence, and I hope Mike is going to do the right thing. I hope so. I hope so. Because if Mike Pence does the right thing, we win the election. T. His is from the number one, or certainly one of the top, constitutional lawyers in our country. He has the absolute right to do it. President Trump repeatedly lied claiming that several states wanted to overturn former Vice President Biden's victory. States wanted a re-vote. The states got defrauded. They were given false information. They voted on it. Now they want to recertify. They want it back. All Vice President Pence has to do is send it back to the states to recertify and we become president and you are the happiest people. Contrary to the statement President Trump dictated the night before, he all but admitted that Vice President Pence did not agree with him. And I actually, I just spoke to Mike. I said, Mike, 
That doesn't take courage. What takes courage is to do nothing. That takes courage. And then we're stuck with a president who lost the election by a lot and we have to live with that for four more years. We're just not going to let that happen. Later in his speech at the Ellipse, President Trump repeated. So, I hope Mike has the courage to do what he has to do. And I hope he doesn't listen to the Renos and the stupid people that he's listening to. This was nothing less than a direct appeal to the large angry crowd to pressure Vice President Mike Pence to change his settled and oft-repeated conclusion about the limits of his authority. It was a shocking attempt to use public opinion to change the Vice President's position. President Trump launched a mob toward the Capitol with the false hope that there was a scenario in which Vice President Pence would do what Eastman and President Trump had asked him to do, preventing the transfer of authority to President-elect Biden. Vice President Pence fulfilled his duty on January 6. The Vice President waited to release his statement out of deference to President Trump, who was still speaking on the ellipse, and ultimately released it just minutes before the joint session convened at 1 p.m. President Trump's speech began late and ran long. He didn't finish speaking until approximately 1.10 p.m. after the joint session had begun at 1 p.m. minutes before he gaveled the joint session into order. Vice President Mike Pence released the Dear Colleague letter he had been working on for days with his staff. There was never any ambiguity in Vice President Pence's understanding of his role and authority, but he wanted to make it clear for everyone to see. This may be the most important thing I ever say, Vice President Pence remarked. Today it will be my duty to preside when the Congress convenes in joint session to count the votes of the Electoral College, and I will do so to the best of my ability, Vice President Pence wrote. Vice President Pence explained that his role as presiding officer is largely ceremonial and dismissed the arguments that he could take unilateral action as contrary to his oath to support and defend the Constitution. As a student of history who loves the Constitution and reveres its framers, I do not believe that the founders of our country intended to invest the vice president with unilateral authority to decide which electoral votes should be counted during the joint session of Congress, and no vice president in American history has ever asserted such authority. Instead, vice presidents presiding over joint sessions have uniformly followed the Electoral Count Act, conducting the proceedings in an orderly manner even where the count resulted in the defeat of their party or their own candidacy. Vice President Pence adheres to the U.S. Constitution and complies with the law governing the certification of the presidential election. When Vice President Pence gaveled the opening of the joint session, he knew that many of his Republican colleagues planned to challenge the election's results based on fictitious claims of fraud. The Vice President took steps to ensure that those objections adhere to the process set forth in the Electoral Count Act. Every four years, on January 6, Vice Presidents read from a script that remains essentially unchanged. Eastman's theory of the vice president's power in the Trump campaign's scheme to convene and submit the slates of alternate, fake, electors motivated Vice President Pence and his advisors to alter the script and to make sure they were prepared to respond to any unexpected actions in the joint session. Vice President Pence met with the Senate parliamentarian on January 3 to discuss the joint session and revise the joint session scripts in consultation with her office. Vice President Pence and the parliamentarian agreed that the vice president's role is ministerial. The vice president knew that the fake slates of electors organized by the Trump campaign were not certified by the states and thus were not valid. He revised the script for the joint session to be transparent with the American people about what the vice president would, and wouldn't, be doing during the joint session. Image, Vice President Pence during the joint session of Congress Photo by Wynn McNamee slash Getty Images One of the most noticeable and important changes to the script was directed specifically at thwarting the fake electors scheme. The vice president knew, informed by the research and analysis of his staff, that absent certification of the electoral votes by a state authority, the purported alternate slates were not consequential and would play no role in the certification of the presidential election at the joint session. The Senate parliamentarian confirmed this understanding. For decades, vice presidents read a similar simple passage concerning the ascertainment of the vote. Most recently, Vice President Joseph Biden read this passage aloud in 2017, as did his most recent predecessors. 
after ascertainment has been had that the certificates are authentic and correct in form, the tellers will count and make a list of the votes cast by the electors of the several states. On January 6, 2021, Vice President Pence read from a revised script, emphasis added. After ascertaining that the certificates are regular in form and authentic, tellers will announce the votes cast by the electors for each state, beginning with Alabama, which the parliamentarians advise me is the only certificate of vote from that state and purports to be a return from the state that has annexed to it a certificate from an authority of that state purporting to appoint or ascertain electors. Vice President Pence used the same phrasing for each of the 50 states counted. The vice president's attention to this issue was warranted. Trump's allies pushed the fake electors scheme until the very end. Although the Trump campaign had taken pains to direct the fake electors to send their documents to the appropriate authorities immediately after voting on December 14, and though the Senate parliamentarians and vice president's offices had been tracking the receipt by mail of both the legitimate and fake certificates, the Trump campaign apparently became concerned that two states' documents had not been received before the joint session. On January 4, the Trump campaign asked Republican Party officials in Wisconsin to fly their fake electors' documents to Washington, D.C. Shortly after, staffers for Rep. Mike Kelly, R.P.A., and Sen. Ron Johnson, R.Y., reached out to Vice President Pence's Director of Legislative Affairs, apparently seeking to deliver the fake certificates. A message from Sen. Johnson's staffer was sent just minutes before the beginning of the joint session. This staffer stated that Senator Johnson wished to hand deliver to the vice president the fake electors certificates from Michigan and Wisconsin. The vice president's aide unambiguously turned him away. Vice President Pence made certain to call for objections as well, in compliance with the Electoral Count Act. After the tellers read off the votes cast for each state, he asked, are there any objections to counting the certificate of vote of the state, that the teller has verified, appears to be regular in form and authentic? For most states, there were no objections. Republicans only rose to object to the states that President Trump contested. The first such state was Arizona. At approximately 1.46 p.m., Congressman Paul Gosar, R. Oz, announced his objection. I rise for myself and 60 of my colleagues to object to the counting of the electoral ballots from Arizona, Gosar said. Vice President Pence then asked, Is the objection in writing and signed by a senator? It was. Senator Ted Cruz endorsed the unfounded challenge to Arizona's electoral votes. Because the objections complied with the law, Vice President Pence directed the House and Senate to withdraw from the joint session so that the House and Senate could separately debate and vote on the objection. When the joint session finally resumed after the attack on the Capitol, the clerks announced the results of each chamber's vote. Just six U.S. senators voted for the objection to the counting of Arizona's electoral college votes. The objection was also defeated in the House, though 121 Republican members voted to reject Arizona's legitimate electors. Pennsylvania was the only other state that Chambers debated, after the House's objection was signed by Senator Josh Hawley, R. Mo. 5.4 President Trump endangers Pence's life, causing the vice president, his family, and staff to narrowly miss the rioters as they flee the mob attacking the Capitol. As the debate over Arizona's legitimate electors took place on the Senate floor, the vice president's staff could see trouble brewing outside. From inside the vice president's ceremonial office, staffers witnessed the crowd swelling on the east side of the Capitol. Then, the rioters broke through security barriers. Jacob told young staffers that they should stand back from the windows, because the vice president's office was not the most popular office on the block right now. The vice president was presiding over the Senate debate on the Arizona objection when the noise from the rioters became audible and those in the Senate chamber realized the rioters had entered the Capitol. The Secret Service evacuated Vice President Pence from the Senate floor at 2.12 p.m. 12 minutes later. At 2.24 p.m., President Trump tweeted that Vice President Pence didn't have the courage to do what should have been done to protect our country and our Constitution. By that time, the Secret Service had moved the vice president to his ceremonial office across the hall. But the situation was spiraling out of control, and they wouldn't stay there long. As Sarah Matthews, the deputy White House press secretary, later explained, President Trump's tweet was like pouring gasoline on the fire. Thirty seconds after President Trump's tweet, 
Rioters who were already inside the Capitol opened the East Rotunda door just down the hall. A mere 30 seconds later, rioters breached the crypt one floor below the vice president. Though the vice president refused the Secret Service's first two attempts to evacuate him from his ceremonial office, the situation quickly became untenable and the vice president was told that the Secret Service could no longer protect him in this office in the Capitol that was quickly being overrun. Mark Short recalls Tim Jeebles, the head of the vice president's Secret Service protective detail, saying, At this point, I can't protect you behind these glass doors, and so I need to move you. This time, the third, the Secret Service was not asking the vice president to move, they were stating the fact that the vice president must be moved. At 2.20 p.m., NSC staff monitoring radio communications reported that the second floor of the Capitol and the door to the Senate chamber have now been breached. At 2.25 p.m., the Secret Service rushed the vice president, his family, and his senior staff down a flight of stairs, through a series of hallways and tunnels to a secure location. The vice president and his team stayed in that same location for the next four and a half hours. The angry mob had come within 40 feet of the vice president as he was evacuated. President Trump never called to check on Vice President Pence's safety, so Mark Short called Mark Meadows to tell him they were safe and secure. Short himself became persona non grata with President Trump. The president directed staff to revoke Short's access to the White House after Vice President Pence refused to betray his oath to the Constitution. Mark Short never spoke with President Trump again. After arriving at the secure location, the head of the vice president's Secret Service detail wanted to move the vice president away from the Capitol, and staff hurried into the waiting vehicles. But the vice president refused to get in the car. As Greg Jacob explained in his testimony to the select committee, the vice president wouldn't get in his car. H. He was determined that unless there was imminent danger to bodily safety that he was not going to abandon the Capitol and let the rioters have a victory of having made the vice president flee or made it difficult to restart the process later that day. It was an unprecedented scene in American history. The President of the United States had riled up a mob that hunted his own vice president. The vice president's staff came to believe that the theory pushed and sold to the public that the vice president had a role to play in the joint session was a cause of the attack on the Capitol. The reason that the Capitol was assaulted was that the people who were breaching the Capitol believed that, the election, outcome, had not yet been determined, and, instead, there was some action that was supposed to take place in Washington, D.C., to determine it, Jacob said. I do think, the violence was the result of that position being continuously pushed and sold to people who ended up believing that with all their hearts. The people had been told that the vice president had the authority to determine the outcome of the election during the joint session. Image, photo provided to the select committee by the National Archives and Records Administration. Of course, that was President Trump's and John Eastman's plan all along, to convince people that the election had been stolen and that Vice President Pence could take action to change the outcome during the joint session on January 6. Jacob was writing an email to Eastman when the Capitol was breached. At 2.14 p.m., just before being evacuated, Jacob hurriedly hit send on his email, but not before adding the following, Thanks to your bullshit, we are now under siege. Eastman quickly replied to Jacob's email and, incredibly, blamed Vice President Pence and Jacob for the attack. The siege is because you and your boss did not do what was necessary to allow this to be aired in a public way so the American people can see for themselves what happened," Eastman wrote. Naturally, Jacob was somewhere between aghast and livid. It was ridiculous to blame Vice President Pence for the attack, when he simply followed the law. The joint session reconvenes, let's get back to work. The Senate reconvened at approximately 8.06 p.m. Congressional leadership and the vice president insisted on finishing the work of the people. Today was a dark day in the history of the United States Capitol, Vice President Pence said. Image, photo provided to the select committee by the National Archives and Records Administration. But thanks to the swift efforts of U.S. Capitol Police, federal, state and local law enforcement, the violence was quelled. The Capitol is secured, and the people's work continues. The Vice President addressed those who wreaked havoc in our Capitol today, saying you did not win. Vice President Pence continued.
Violence never wins. Freedom wins. And this is still the people's house. And as we reconvene in this chamber, the world will again witness the resilience and strength of our democracy, for even in the wake of unprecedented violence and vandalism at this capital, the elected representatives of the people of the United States have assembled again on the very same day to support and defend the Constitution of the United States. Let's get back to work, Vice President Pence concluded. Despite the violence that had unfolded at the Capitol, Eastman kept agitating for further delay. At 11.44 p.m. on January 6, Eastman sent yet another email to Greg Jacob. In a shockingly tone-deaf manner, Eastman claimed that the Electoral Count Act had been violated already, by allowing debate beyond two hours, so, he argued, Vice President Pence should no longer be concerned that what President Trump and Eastman had pressured him to do also would violate it. Of course, as Jacob pointed out, the debate couldn't have been completed in two hours due to the intervening riot of several hours. Eastman argued that Vice President Pence should adjourn for 10 days to allow the legislatures to finish their investigations, as well as to allow a full forensic audit of the massive amount of illegal activity that has occurred here. Eastman described this, a delay in the certification of the vote and the peaceful transfer of power with no legal or historical precedent or support, based on entirely specious and disproven allegations of election fraud, following on a violent attack on the seat of American democracy, as a relatively minor violation. Vice President Pence later described Eastman's email as rubber room stuff, meaning it was certifiably crazy. 5.5 Aftermath of the Attack Eastman called Hirschman on January 7 to discuss litigation on behalf of the Trump campaign in Georgia. This gave Hirschman another opportunity to lay into Eastman. Are you out of your effing mind? Hirschman asked. I only want to hear two words coming out of your mouth from now on orderly transition, Hirschman said. After some berating, Eastman repeated after Hirschman, orderly transition. Now I'm going to give you the best free legal advice you're ever getting in your life, Hirschman said. Get a great effing criminal defense lawyer, you're going to need it. Days afterward, Eastman sent an email to Giuliani, making a request that tacitly acknowledged just how much trouble he was in, I've decided that I should be on the pardon list, if that is still in the works. Vice President Pence and his team never bowed to President Trump's relentless pressure. They began January 6, 2021, with a prayer. The attack on the U.S. Capitol delayed the peaceful transfer of power. The joint session did not end until early in the morning on January 7. At 3.50 a.m. that morning, short text advice President Pence a passage from 2 Timothy, chapter 4, verse 7, I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I have kept the faith. Thank you for your time. Please remember to like this video, subscribe to our channel for more videos like this, and share this video with others. End notes are shown, but not read.